Uh, hey, if you have your Bibles, let's just jump in here. Um, I invite you today to open your Bibles to uh, Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, verse 27 through 30. Uh, if this is your first time here at Restoration, first, second, even third time, we want to welcome you to Restoration. Uh, this is a place where you can explore your faith. You don't have it to have it all together. Uh, it's not about a religion. It's about a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so I just want to welcome you here today. I want to welcome you, too, if you are watching us online. We're just really glad that you are here. Uh, we're going through the book of Mark section by section, and today we land on Mark chapter 8, verse 27 through 30. I titled the message for today, The Great Confession. The Great Confession. Uh, and so, so far in this journey of going through the Gospel of Mark, the first section and the first major portion of the Gospel, we've just seen Jesus uh, ministering in this region of Galilee. Like, that's what he's been doing. He's just been healing people, preaching the gospel. Uh, he's been uh, uh, ministering to the hurting and the broken. That's what we've seen so far. But today, church, is a huge day. I mean, I'm so excited about today because today we hit one of the peaks in the Gospel of Mark. We, we hit one of the, the high points in the Gospel of Mark. All so far, these seven and even eight chapters are leading up to this very point. And then after this, I mean, this is the hinge in the Gospel of Mark. Like, it's right in the middle, right? There's about 16 chapters in Mark. And so right in the middle, uh, this chapter serves as a hinge. Why? Because from here on out, man, Jesus is making a beeline towards the cross. I mean, he is making a beeline towards the cross. He's headed towards Jerusalem. He's going to be teaching his disciples in the next three, three chapters uh, on what it looks like to be a disciple. Like, what does it really look like to be a disciple of Christ, especially after Jesus, Jesus Christ is gone? And so for the next three chapters, Jesus is going to be really focusing on uh, some deep discipleship. So I really want to encourage you today to not miss these next three chapters. In your, as you, as, as a follower of Jesus, as a disciple of Jesus, man, these next three chapters are going to be critical in your spiritual growth, your spiritual development, as Jesus really focuses in on the disciples. But today we hit a high point in the Gospel of Mark. So again, if you have your Bible, let's read uh, today together. And it says this. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say, Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. Let us go before the Lord today. Jesus, you alone. Jesus, you alone are worthy of our praise. Jesus, you alone are worthy of our affections. Jesus, you alone are worthy of our worship. And God, as we worshiped you with our lips through singing your praises, singing your goodness and your faithfulness. God, we worship you today by focusing on your word, by meditating on your word, by understanding your word. God, lead us and guide us here today through the power of your Holy Spirit in us. God, I pray that your word would encourage, uplift, and even challenge here today. God, we love you. And for the next few moments, I pray that we can give you our entire focus to what you have to say for us, to us today through your word. In your holy name we pray. Amen. What is the most, the single most important question in the world? What is the single most important question in the world? Well, if you are single, uh, probably the most important question for you right now is like, who am I going to marry? Like that is one of the most important questions for you. If you are single, you're like, man, who is going to be, you know, that person that I'm going to spend the rest of my life with? Who's that person that I'm going to meet and, and walk down the aisle with? Like, who's that person, right? Uh, if you're single here, just raise your hand really high and then start looking around. You never know. I'm just, I'm trying to help you out. I'm just trying to help you out. Uh, if you're young, uh, you're probably thinking like, hey, and even so, nowadays there's a lot of career changes, but mainly if you're starting out your career as a young person, you're thinking, man, what career should I pursue? What career should I go? What way, what, what is God calling me to do uh, with my life, you know, with my career? Maybe you're a parent 
Maybe the important question for you is like, man, how are my kids going to turn out? Like, how am I, am I a good enough parent? How are my kids going to turn out? How can I be a parent that set, sets up my children for success? And maybe those things are, are on your mind right now. Those of you that are kind of on the, on the um, uh, later stages in life, on your second half of life, you're thinking about retirement like, how am I going to spend, you know, the rest of my life, the, the few years of my life that I have left? Like, how it, can I really use those with, with great purpose and live those with great purpose? If you're a business owner, you're, like, you're thinking, like, how can I, you know, uh, increase revenue in my company uh, while maintaining a uh, really good culture and care for my employees? And, and the list goes on and on of questions that many of us uh, really think, right, and, and ask ourselves. But here, here's the thing. While all these questions are important, all of these questions are very important, they are not the most important question in the world. They're not. The most important question in the world is this. Who do you say Jesus is? That is the most important question in the world. Who do you say Jesus is? Who do I say Jesus is? This is the most important question in the world. This question is not just an abstract theological question that theologians and scholars and pastors debate about. Every person's answer to this question will determine their eternal destiny. This question is the most important question in the world. Who do you say Jesus is? Now, here's my goal for today. Here's my goal for today. Actually, before I go there, let me say this. There's really no shortage of opinion, right, when it comes to who Jesus is. Like, everyone has an opinion of who Jesus is. Everyone. Everyone has some kind of opinion or perception on Christ. So let's just take a look. World religions, right? Let's just take a look at world religions. Uh, Muslims believe that Jesus was one of Allah's prophets. They reject the notion that Jesus is God. Even on a human level, they believe that Muhammad was a greater man and prophet than Jesus. If you're Jehovah, if the Jehovah's Witness, uh, they believe that Jesus Christ is not God, but the first son that God brought forth, so he was created, uh, he is God, but inferior to only Father God. Mormons believe that Jesus is separate from God the Father, that he was created as spirit by the Father and Mother in heaven and is the elder brother of all people and spirit beings. His body was created as a result of a sexual union between God the Father and Mary. Jesus was married. His death on the cross does not pay for the sins of all people, but does provide everyone with a resurrection. If you're a New Ager, New Agers believe Jesus was an enlightened man. He was in touch with his cosmic consciousness and was able to tap into his universal power to heal others. New Agers believe that, God, that he is only God in the same sense that we are also God's. Hindus believe that Jesus was just one manifestation or appearance of the supreme God of the universe. Jews believe Jesus was a teacher, but no more than that. Deists believe that Jesus was a nice guy who said a lot of important things. However, they don't know if he is the son of God or re even really know what that means. Buddhists believe that Jesus Christ was a good teacher, though less important than Buddha. That's what people believe in other religions about Jesus. What does our culture believe about Jesus? Well, I think most, uh, at least the, the things that I run into in our culture, I think a lot of the times our culture believes that Jesus existed, that Jesus was real. Uh, they don't believe that Jesus is God. Uh, they believe that Jesus was some good moral teacher, but some of his teachings are outdated, especially the things that run against culture. And so Jesus is his outdated a um, good teacher. They believe that Jesus is a good teacher and a good person uh, with great, you know, teachings, uh, but they deny the supernatural. They deny his deity. They deny the resurrection. They deny all of that stuff, and that's what culture believes about Christ. 
What about Christianity? Not biblical Christianity. What about cultural Christianity? Because they're different. Cultural Christianity versus biblical Christianity is different. What does cultural Christianity believe about Jesus? Well, cultural Christianity believes that Jesus came into this world to make bad people good, right? Behavior modification. That Jesus came to this world just to try to make bad people good. But here's the deal. Jesus didn't come to make bad people good. Jesus came to make dead people alive. He didn't come for just to change the way you behave. He didn't. That's what culture Christianity believes. Culture Christianity believes that Jesus is Savior, but not Lord. Hey, I, I want Jesus to pay for my sins. I want to be saved, but as far as Lord, oh, I'm not giving up control. I'm, I'm, I'm taking the wheel. I dictate how I live my life. That's cultural Christianity. Cultural Christianity believes that Jesus is a spiritual genie, the one I go to when I need something and the one I don't go to when I don't need something. Cultural Christianity. Cultural Christianity believes Jesus or treats Jesus like a spiritual Santa Claus. I only see him only on big Sundays. We kind of treat him like, a, like, a, like holidays here in our culture. We believe that Jesus is all love and grace. Cultural Christianity that Jesus is only love and that Jesus is only grace, that Jesus was never mean to people. But yes, that's true. Jesus is love and Jesus is grace. But Jesus is also wrath. Jesus is also judgment. And Jesus is also holiness. But again, that's what cultural Christianity believes. Cultural Christianity, even nowadays, believes that there's so many ways to God, that it's, no, it's, not, it's not anymore just through Jesus Christ, that there are other ways that you can get to heaven. Listen, there's only one answer to the most important question in the world, and there's only one way to God, and that's through Jesus Christ, amen? Only one way. That's what people believe. That's what the world religions believe. That's what culture believes. That's what cultural Christianity believes. So my goal today is simple, to put before you the answer to the most important question in the world. Who do you say Jesus is and its implication for our lives? So let's just jump in here to the scripture. I want us to understand the scripture here today. Verse 27. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? Jesus is traveling northbound to a town called Caesarea Philippi. He's heading north. It's about 25 miles north of where he was in Bethsaida. And this region was strongly identified with various religions. It had been a center for Baal worship. The Greek god Pan had shrines there, and Herod the Great had built a temple there to honor Augustus Caesar. So it's a pagan place. And so Jesus heads north with his disciples to a city called Caesarea Philippi, a town called Caesarea Philippi. Now Mark doesn't state the reason why Jesus heads north, but it is more more likely or most likely that Jesus is doing it for discipleship purposes. He is trying to train his disciples. Again, these next three chapters are Jesus and his disciples. And he's going to be teaching them and really uh, discipling them as he heads towards the cross. And so really, he's taking his disciples on a retreat. Like school is in session here in this passage. And so on the way there, Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say that I am? He asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? Did Jesus really ask the question because he didn't know the answer? Because he didn't know what people thought of him? No. Jesus knew exactly what people thought of him. Jesus knows everything. He knows all. But he was asking the question because I believe he was setting his disciples up for the second question. Like he was setting them up for the, the real, he's kind of like the one-two punch, right? And this is number one, this is the jab. And so he's setting them up for the bigger question. 
But Jesus nonetheless asked the disciples, who do people say that I am? It's a question of his identity. And in, Jesus, and in Mark, Jesus' identity has been the central theme uh, up until this very point. I mean, just think about this. From the very first verse in Mark, uh, Mark calls Jesus the Christ and the Son of God in verse 1, chapter 1. Uh, when Jesus gets baptized, the Father is calling him his beloved Son. Uh, the demons call him the Holy One of God, the Son of God, the Son of the Most High in chapter 1, chapter 3, and chapter 5. The people are all amazed throughout these first seven and eight verses, and they're like trying to figure out who this guy is. Like, who is Jesus? After Jesus calms the storms, the disciples ask, man, who is this guy that the winds and the waves obey him? And so there's been this big question on Jesus' identity, at least from the human perspective. You see, because de the demons know who Jesus is. God the Father knows who Jesus is. The only people so far in the Gospel of Mark that don't know who Jesus is are human beings, are people. But today, that's going to change. And so he asked them the question, who do people say that I am? And they responded. They said, well, there's a rumor out there that, they, that people are saying that you're John the Baptist. That you're John the Baptist. Remember, uh, Herod had John the Baptist beheaded. I mean, he's dead. So people think that uh, there was this opinion that people thought that Jesus kind of like was resurrected or revived or came back from the dead as John the Baptist. And especially Herod. I mean, Herod was scared that that was true because he beheaded Jesus. So he thought that Jesus came back as John the Baptist trying to get revenge on him. There's another thought that Jesus was Elijah, the Old Testament prophet Elijah. There was much speculation actually in Judaism concerning the return of the prophet Elijah. Drawn from passages from Malachi chapter 3 and 4. And Elijah's unusual ascension uh, to heaven. Let me just read those to you so we, you understand. Mark chapter, or Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, it says this. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Malachi chapter 4, 5 through 6. Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. This is how the Old Testament ends, church, with the promise of a coming Elijah. There's 400 years of silence, nothing happens, no prophecy, no nothing, and then comes in John the Baptist preparing the way for Christ. So this is how the Old Testament ends. So Old Testament Jewish people are waiting for a Elijah to come. Why? Well, because of the prophecies, but because Elijah never died. Elijah never died. He was just like taken in an elevator to heaven. Okay, let me just kind of read that to you. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11. And as they still went on and talked, behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And so they thought because Elijah never died, right? And there's a prophecy of Elijah, then Jesus sending Elijah, and the, or God sending Elijah, and it's probably Jesus. And so a lot of people thought, well, it's probably John the Baptist or maybe Elijah coming back. And some people said, well, you know, it's, it's one of the prophets. It's one of the prophets, this comes from Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15. It says this, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to, it is to him who you shall listen. So there's just a lot of opinions, like today, of who Jesus is. Is he John the Baptist? You know, coming back from the dead. Is he Elijah? Like, is he one of the Old Testament prophets? What I find very interesting, though, is that... No one says that Jesus is the Messiah. Like, that's not a really common belief. Why? I find it interesting because during those days, there was a lot of people that would say, hey, I'm the Messiah, and then next thing you know, they weren't, and they died, and they were never resurrected from the, dead, from the dead. And so there was a lot of people claiming to be the Messiah. So it's kind of weird that they wouldn't say, like, well, he's probably, like, you know, the Messiah. It's just really interesting. A lot of, that would happen a lot. Also, it's very interesting, do you notice that the disciples only tell Jesus the good perceptions of him. <laughs> you notice that? They only tell Jesus all the good things. Well, I mean, that's awesome, right? Being compared to John the Baptist, man, that dude, like, he was a preacher. 
And that, that dude came with fire. Elijah, I mean, that, that's a big Old Testament prophet. Like, those are cool things to be compared to. They're flattering. But it's just interesting that the disciples never told him, well, you know, some other people think um, that uh, the, way, the reason why you do miracles, Jesus, is because you're getting the power from Satan. Like, that's what the religious leaders of the day actually thought of Jesus. I just found it interesting that the disciples never said anything mean like that to, to, to Jesus. And so Jesus asked them, hey, who do people say that I am? What's, what's the common opinion in the culture of who I am? John the Baptist, Elijah, or the prophet? And then he turns to the disciples and he asks them the second question. And he, and in verse 29, and he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered to him, you are the Christ. Jesus looks at them. And says, but who do you say that I am? He asked them the most important question in the world. In the original language, it could be translated directly like this. More of an emphatic tone. But you, who do you say that I am? That's really in the original language. That's what Jesus is trying to say. But you, but you. Yeah, I know what the people say, but you, who do you say that I am? Do you agree with the opinion of others? Do you agree with the opinion of the culture? Do you agree with what they're saying about me? John Calvin says this about this passage. He says, the design of Christ was to confirm his disciples fully in the true faith that they might not be tossed about the amidst various reports. He wanted them to be solidified in who he was, not to be tossed around like waves by the opinions of the culture. And so he asked them the question. And so Peter, the spokesman for the disciples, I picture him kind of standing up and speaking out and speaks out and answers the most important question in the world. But I want you to understand the weight of this answer, church. I want you to understand what Peter had to go against when he answered this question. Peter had to go against the Roman government, who you know, didn't care really who Christians worshipped as long as they affirmed Caesar as Lord, He had to go against the popular opinion of the Jewish crowds who thought Jesus was either John the Baptist, Elijah, or another prophet. He probably had friends and family members who believed this. He also had to go against the Jewish religious leaders of the day who were influential, who were educated, who were trained in the scriptures, He had to go against them. The disciples had no formal education. They were fishermen. They were normal people with no formal training. And in the face of contrary views and opinions of Jesus that could cost them their lives, which they did, Peter answers the most important question in the world. He says, you are the Christ. Against all of those things, Peter says, you are the Christ. Jesus is Lord, not Caesar. Jesus is Lord. He is the Christ. You are the Christ. The Christ means the anointed one. And Peter confesses him in the midst of different opinions of the day. You are the Christ. You are the anointed one. You are the expected one. You are the redeeming one. You are the saving one. You are the righteous one. You are the forgiving one. You are the hopeful one. You are the only one. He confesses Christ. He is the Christ. Church, 
we're going to have to confess Christ in our culture. Well, you have the boldness to do it. To stand up against all popular opinion. Friends, family, co-workers. And boldly proclaim that he is the Christ. Jesus, after they, Peter makes this public confession, he strictly charges them, verse 30, not to tell no one about him. How do we know it was the right answer? Because Jesus says, hey, don't tell anybody that I'm the Christ. It's not my time yet to go to the cross yet. It's too early. And people don't have a full understanding yet of who I am. Not even the disciples. Although this answer was completely right, it wasn't fully right, and we'll get to it next week. And he says, hey, don't say, don't tell anybody of who I am. The great confession. You are the Christ. Now, here's the cool thing. Not only did Peter confess Christ with his lips, Peter confessed Christ with his life. He confessed Christ with his life. Peter wasn't just someone who who gave God lip service and told him what he wanted to hear. He confessed Christ with his life. In the parallel account in Matthew, Matthew 16, this is what Jesus tells Peter after he makes this confession. He says, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus tells Peter that on Peter, and on Peter's confession that Jesus is the Christ, he will build his church. That Peter and the apostles are the foundation for the church, for you and I. And Jesus is the chief cornerstone of the church that he is building. And boy, Peter was a solid foundation. And you bet that Peter confessed Jesus not only with his lips but his life. How do we know that? Well, we, we just know that from Peter's life. After Pentecost, Peter was bold. I mean, if you, if you read the book of Acts, man, he was bold in his preaching of Christ. He was bold. He, he saved a lot of people. He was arrested and warned not to teach about Jesus any longer. And what did he do? He preached Christ even in the midst of persecution, real persecution and opposition. Herod imprisoned Peter. He was in jail for it, but God saved him. Peter led the disciples and took a prominent role in the early church. He was a church leader, and Peter died as a martyr in Rome under Nero. Tradition holds that Peter was crucified upside down because he felt unworthy to die in the same manner as Jesus. He confessed Jesus with his life. Do you get what I'm trying to say? you get that? Peter wrote first and second Peter that we have in our scriptures. And guess where the information from Mark comes from that we've been studying for like a year? Where do you think that comes from? Peter. Do you know that? Peter told Mark what to write. Peter wrote first and second Peter, and he helped Mark write the Gospel of Mark. Peter confessed Jesus with his lips and his life. And so, church, that's the main idea of today. That's the main point. True believers, true believers, confess Jesus with their lips and their lives. So, Two questions for you today. First, who do you say Jesus is? Who do you say Jesus is? Husbands, the question is, what does your wife say? Who does your wife say that Jesus is? No, no, no. Who do you say 
Jesus is. Who do you say? Wives, I thought about what your husband says ever. Who do you say Jesus is? Church members? It doesn't matter if your pastor says who Jesus is. Who do you say Jesus is? Young adults, it's not about your parents' faith anymore. Your parents can't save you. Who do you say Jesus is? Do you believe that Jesus is the Jesus of other religions? Do you believe that Jesus is the Jesus of culture? Do you believe that Jesus is the Jesus of cultural Christianity? There are only two answers to this question. Either you believe Jesus is the Christ or you don't. That's it. There's no middle ground. Do you believe he is the Christ? Do you believe? Church, my hope and prayer is that you believe that he is the Christ because all of eternity rests on that question. All of eternity I love what Steve Lawson says about this. He says, you can't be wrong about Christ and be right with God. Let me just say that again. You can't be wrong about Christ and be wrong or be right with God. You can't. You just can't. Who is Jesus? Here's the thing. Jesus made it clear who he is. It doesn't matter what, who we think he is. Who does he say he is? He's the Christ. Question number two. This is where it kind of, here are the implications for us. If you do believe Jesus is the Christ, does your life reflect who you say Jesus is. If you truly say that he is the Christ, does your life reflect who who you say Jesus is? If you can give the right answer, but there is no transformation in your life, your life looks like the world, What kind of faith do you really have? Let me tell you, you don't have saving faith. You don't. What I'm about to say is going to sound a little harsh, but I want you to know the gravity of believing in a Christ with our mind, but never fully surrendering control to him. If you believe that he is the Christ, if you could give the right answer, but your life doesn't show it, your faith is a faith that is worse than demons. James chapter two, verse 19. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Demons believe that Jesus is the Christ. And they shudder. They're scared. There's still that fear of him. What we believe about Christ is the most important thing about us, church. Why? Because if we truly believe that he is the Christ, that one day he's coming back, that he's the redeeming one, the one that saved us, forgave us, if we truly believe that, 
and it should impact our lives. If it's a genuine faith, then it transforms our lives from the inside out. Do you confess Jesus with your lips and with your life? I hope you do. I hope you do. Our beliefs of Jesus shape our actions. If you believe that he is the expected one, you will live with a sense of urgency and passion and purpose in your life. If you believe that he's the forgiving one, you will live forgiven. If you believe that he is the redeeming one, you will live redeemed and helping other people experience that redemption. If you believe he is the righteous one, then you will live righteously through the help of the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. If you believe he's the sacrificial one, then you will live sacrificially as well. Jesus is not asking for lip service, church, but life sacrifice, life surrender. Why does this matter? Why does it matter that uh, we confess Jesus not only with the lips, with our lips, with our lives as well? Because Jesus is still building his church. He's still building his church. And the gates of hell will not prevail. No amount of darkness, no amount of evil, no amount of wickedness can overcome the church. Doesn't matter what CNN or Fox News is saying, our world is going down here in the church. Jesus promised, I will build my church. Jesus is the one building it. We are the tools that he is using to build the church. That's why it matters. That we go out into a world that's broken and hurting, confessing that Jesus is the only way, that he is the Savior, that he is the Christ, with our lips and our lives. Preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. And always use words. Always use words. And make sure that your life reflects those words. First Sunday, we take communion as a church. And what better way for us to take communion than on Peter's great confession? that he's the Christ, that he's the savior, that he's the redeeming one, the one who bore the wrath of God upon himself, the wrath that we were supposed to bear, and took it upon himself, satisfying the wrath of God, and turning God's perspective on us, looking at us as righteous because of what Jesus did on the cross. What better way to celebrate that, to remember that? If you are a believer, would you reflect on that today? Would you ask your que- with yourself that question, who do I say Jesus is? Ask yourself that question today. Does my life reflect it? Meditate on that. I'm going to give you some time. In just a moment, I'm going to dismiss everyone to take a communion cup, come back to your seat, take some time to reflect. And then I would encourage you to begin to open this little cup to kind of get a little sticky. Open it up, get it ready. I'm going to lead us into communion. If you're not a believer, one, I encourage you to give your life to Jesus today. Do you know how Peter understood 
that Jesus was the Christ? Do you know how he understood? Do you think that Peter studied the scriptures and, and uh, was enlightened somehow or, or that Peter uh, you know, used his human abilities to understand who Christ was? Do you know how Peter really came to know who Jesus, that, to, to know that Jesus was the Christ? Scripture in Matthew, same passage, says that God revealed it to him. That God revealed it to him. Only God can reveal to you who he is. Only God can Remove the blindfold from your heart. You can't do it on your own. Only God can. But here's the cool thing. The Bible promises that if we come to God genuinely, he will never cast us away. He will never cast us away. If you don't know Jesus, I encourage you today. I plead with you. Repent. Repent of your sin. And place your faith in Christ. Turn away from your former life and go towards Christ. I also pray for those of you that believe you're saved and you're not. Just because you are in church doesn't mean you are in Christ. May God reveal that to you today. Come to him. Come to him. He won't reject you. He'll embrace you. A lot of people think that if I come to Jesus, I got to have all my stuff cleaned up. I got to have my life perfect. No, no. You don't have to come to him perfect because he's already perfect. Come and receive his grace, his love, his mercy, his forgiveness, his life, his joy.